What's up, y'all? It's Ryan Banta again here, um, having a discussion today. There's an interesting debate between, or not a debate, but a conversation about the importance of sprint technique. An example was uh, used by two of my coaching buddies, one Coach Tripp, who now coaches out at Lutheran St. Peter's, uh, and kind of discussing the sprinting prowess of a high school in our area known as SLU High. And uh, SLU High has had multiple state champions and I believe state record holders uh, in the sprint relays and open sprints over a long period of time. They've been very, very, very successful. Now, interestingly enough though, people wonder because of this, you know, man, their sprinters must look amazing. Well, to be fair, and according to even Coach Porter, he's discussed how his mechanics of his sprint athletes have not really necessarily been the best. Um, yet, even though their mechanics aren't what you would consider ideal, they win championships. They've broken state records. They've run really fast. So what's the point? Is the point that sprinting mechanics has no value? Training sprinting mechanics doesn't push the needle uh, to higher performance? Um, or is it the fact of situation? environment, time management, or triaging the importance of what you're doing as a coach in practice. So let's get something out before we even go into the five reasons why I believe sprint mechanics should be trained and why they're so very important for us as coaches to be training, not just for sprinting, not just for track and field, but for all events. Okay, but let's get this one thing aside first. The most important thing you can do as a coach is make your athletes faster. In pretty much every sport that is not stationary, like billiards or golf, okay, everyone can benefit from being faster. So that becomes the most important thing, the thing that you protect in every practice. Not the weight room, not a lengthy warm-up, not drills, not cooling down, not plyometrics, not core, running in running fast. And that means running fast for people who run uh, 60 meter dash indoors, all the way up to somebody who runs marathons. You need to get faster, okay? Now, with that being said, the next thing that can help a sprinter become faster or a runner or an athlete become faster is through their technique to be efficient. Now, one of the things that we need to talk about first, number one, we got Sprinting, the reason my five thoughts is, number one, it works. Number two is this idea that Derek Hansen has come up with, which is a real simple concept called be the hashtag. Number three, mechanics and training and sprint technique needs to be trained every day. That doesn't mean it's the centerpiece of your program, but it should be trained every day. And I'm going to talk about when you train it. Number four, you need to maximize the individual's technique. Technique is going to be different depending on the sprinter. If you look at Mike Johnson, former world record holder in the 400-meter dash, and then you look at Gay uh, Tyson Gay, you look at Usain Bolt, you look at Asafa Powell, you look at Carl Lewis, you look at Kim Collins, all these runners have similarities, but amorphically they're built different. They've got different body posture. They've got different body composition. They've got different limb length. They run the race very differently. So you need to maximize that individual's technique. Next thing, okay? Sprinting mechanics and working on it reduces injuries, okay? Not by just making the athlete more efficient, but through other means also. Okay, so first off, number one, Doing sprinting technique works, but you've got to know how to coach it, okay? And the biggest thing is, is that your arms, a lot of coaches look at the arms and also arms don't matter nearly as much as what the athlete is doing. There's a thing called backside mechanics and frontside mechanics. And all things being equal, you want the frontside mechanics to be good. So if this is the belly button of the sprinter right here, you want that leg getting up as high as you possibly can, okay, before that foot drops down and smashes the ground. And what I mean by high, you don't want to appear like you're a rockette, but you want it to get to the belly button so that the person can punch the foot down. And you want to see that ankle stepping over the knee of the leg that's extended during contact on the ground to provide the opportunity for that foot to fly through the path so that it can be punched down into the ground. Frontside mechanics is the most important thing. 
So what does that mean? That means that you need to be training the whole part of that movement and the breakdowns of the individual aspects of that movement all the time. Now here's the other issue. It takes about 500 hours to change someone's technique in a pattern that they've been doing their entire life that they've been doing wrong. Now, when you hear that, you go, well, man, I, you know, that's, that's ridiculous. I don't have time for 500 hours. You don't have time for 500 hours in a single week, obviously. There's not enough hours. You don't have time in a month. You don't have time in a year. But over the course of four years, if you're doing your part as a coach, you can improve that. But it requires work, okay? Now, what does that look like? Because it takes so long, the changes that you're going to make over time can't be drastic. It can't force the athlete out of their natural gait. It has to be something that's implemented over time, and over time, they get better. Now, how do they get better? Well, there's a whole bunch of things that go down. First of all, everybody's got a substance in their body called myelin. When you stress the system and you slightly overload the neurological system in that particular firing pattern, the substance of myelin wraps around the neurons, creating a big chunky sausage-like material around the neurons. Over time, when that's accomplished, what happens? Well, the signal gets stronger, it gets more accurate, and it gets there faster. In essence, you become faster from a neurological system, okay? It's like going from dial-up internet to wide, you know, high-speed internet that we all have nowadays, all right? So that's one thing. Number two, the athlete has to become comfortable moving through those movements. So what has to happen for them to be comfortable? Well, they have to have what I like to call dynamic flexibility or mobile flexibility or suppleness. And in order to do that, it takes some time for the muscles and the connective tissue and the body to get used to moving in that position. They might not have the range of motion right away. But over time, through that active action of doing the drills and doing the different technique, you're going to be able to build that, okay? The third thing is, is it's going to build actual muscle strength within those movements when you overload the system in those movements. So if you're doing an A skip, and, and you guys can go to my videos on my YouTube page and look at all my drills. I've got them buried uh, a few videos back on this particular YouTube channel that eventually this will go to. Um, you can see all these drills. Now you're going, well, that athlete doesn't do that in sprinting. The athlete never paws back like that on an A skip or a B skip. That's not That never happens. Well, no, it doesn't. But what you're doing is you're overloading a system. You're overloading the hip junction and the lumbar area and the lower core. And then you're also overloading the hamstring and the posterior as that foot's coming down into the ground and pulling back against the ground so that the hamstring knows how it is supposed to be stretched and then fire as that foot then steps up and over the knee and then punches back down into the ground. So over time, it works. Every athlete in my program, if you watch them from the year one that they're in the program, from year four, they actually get better. Why? Because I am like the drill maniac. So what do we do? We have a different package of eight drills that we do every other day for about three weeks, and then we switch that A day and that B day package the next three weeks, and then the next three weeks, and then at the end of the season, we have this final phase of drills. Now. The key to that is not only are you switching it every other day, so what's happening is you're allowing that neurological system and those little particulates of the joints and the muscles and the tendons to recover, okay? Then you're stimulating with something else the next day that's a little bit different that builds off of some of the movements you're trying to attack. So that's idea number one. Idea number two is over the course of that three weeks when you transition to a new set of drills, what you're doing is you're building on the previous two packages of drills with the eight individual drills in those packages and so you build off of it so it's not something radically new that's going to risk the athlete getting injured so instead of maybe just doing an a skip now you're doing an a skip where you run out and do a mini sprint or now you're doing an a skip a skip b skip b skip an a skip b skip complex instead of just doing a high knee maybe you're doing a high knee into an a run or you're doing a high knee transitioning into a butt kick you know so these are different types of things that you do as you move through the different phases as you move through the different phases, it should require more work of some kind. So in my second phase, we add hills into some of our drills and we add in mini sprints. In phase three, 
what we do is we make the drills more neurologically taxing from a skill standpoint. They've got to do a lot of different things. So they'll do an A skip, a C skip, and then a quick leg. Um, they'll build and blend some of these drills together. Okay. And then in our fourth phase, what we do is we add in basically all these different types of maximum velocity types of things as we put all the skill sets together to become the whole part towards that last phase of the season. Now you go, wait a second, why aren't you doing that all year long? We're already doing some of that stuff all year long. This just shows up in our drill package. Now, where do we show our drill package at? Where do we put it? Well, we put it after our team huddle. So what we do is we have our general warm-up, and that can look different also, depending on if it's a static warm-up or a dynamic warm-up. Then we have our team huddle. Then we go and do our drills. Now, why do we do that? Because what happens after our general warm-up is we have our suppleness part of our practice. And so what happens in our suppleness part of our practice is sometimes we static stretch, which I know a lot of people are like, oh, that dampens the neurologic system and increases injuries. That's not true. Research was done wrong. The research was done not on a 15-second stretch. It was done on a 90-second stretch. Okay? And then they had the athletes go do something absolute maximum velocity and they got bad results. The reality is, is that if you follow up a supplement package with plyometrics, with explosive drills, with explosive running, and then you go run, you'll find that all of a sudden you get the benefit of the supplement without losing the neurological benefits of the speed and power. Okay. So it's always at the beginning of our practice. So if you want it to work, it's got to be when the body is most neurologically fresh because one of the things you're really trying to improve is the neurological system and the firing patterns to get those mechanics to look better, okay? Then um, the thing you have to remember is it has to be done every day and it has to be progressive where you have a base set of drills and then as you move forward three weeks, those drills get a little bit tougher. You add in some things. The drills get a little bit tougher and you add in some things so that there's a progression that once the athletes are good at those mechanics, there's a progression, okay? So they can be improved. When you work on running technique, don't put them in a lane, put them on a line, okay? We always talk about being hips tall, okay? We're gonna talk about the B, the hashtag here in a second. We also change doing things with our hands, okay? So we put our hands in different positions all the time when we're doing drills, because what that does is your arms are the training wheels of your body. They don't really help you, but they can hurt you. Now, at full speed, at full flight sprinting mechanics at maximum velocity, there's been studies that say the arms actually add 7% of the overall force when used correctly. So do the arms matter? Yes. But 93% of what's going on is everything else. Having tension in the core, you know, uh, usable tension or conscientious tension, as I like to call it, being mechanically sound through the body and through the athlete. Now, the thing that you have to remember, though, is it's going to be a little different for each individual athlete. So we'll talk about that in a second. But a general principle that you can really figure out for your athletes very easy is the thing be the hashtag, which means that be the hashtag means that the sprinter is going to have mechanics that look like they are a hashtag, okay? It's got to be boom, boom, boom. Okay, and what that means is, is the front knee and the back leg, if you were able to draw lines, could fit nicely into that hashtag action. And if you want more information about that, you can talk to Derek Hansen. But it's very simple because then when you film it, you're going to be able to show the sprinter what the drill is doing. But also when they sprint at full speed and you film it, you can show them what they're doing wrong and the things that need to be improved. And instead of going into a bunch of technical garbage and this is doing this and this joint's doing this and you're doing this and you're greater truncanter and throwing out a whole bunch of stuff that the athletes have no idea, they all know what a hashtag is. It's a very simple concept for them to immediately latch onto. And in their mind's eye, every teenager and every college athlete knows what that looks like. And it's very easy at full flight running mechanics to film them and to draw those lines and say, are you fitting within this hashtag correctly or are you not? They need to be trained every day because learning is taking time every day. It has to happen. Just like Tony Holler talks about speed is like a tree. You know, it grows slowly over time, but it can get really robust over a long period of time if you're training it all the time. It's important to train technical skills all the time. So when we go back to simple principles, what are things that can be improved and how long does it take to improve them? Well, number one, flexibility can be improved day to day. 
So part of what we're doing here is improving our dynamic flexibility. That can be improved day to day. Number two, endurance can be improved week to week. Well, what are we doing with endurance? Well, we're helping by doing these drills and becoming more efficient. We're becoming more efficient, which improves our endurance, our speed endurance. Because we become technically more sound, we can hold that speed for longer. Number three, you can improve power month to month. Well, how does training drills every day help improve your power? Because you can access the power by using the body the way that it is meant to be. The body is a series of rubber bands. And so there's all this free energy in your body that you might not be using if you don't have the proper technique. You're making way more of an effort and you're doing a hell of a lot more work than you need to. And if you cannot apply that foot, if that foot doesn't get to that belly button and you can punch that foot down properly, then you're never going to be as powerful as you can because you're not taking advantage of Newton's law of getting that equal and opposite reaction of punching that foot down and then being able to hop down the track because guess what, guys? Sprinting is basically jumping really, really, really fast. Okay? So technique really matters, but it's got to be trained daily. So that's power month to month. Speed year to year. So in order to do these things, to move right, to move fast, to handle that speed and to improve it year to year, you can't have injuries. If you get hurt, then you lose out on all those opportunities to run fast, which you need to do to improve speed. And when people have hamstring injuries, it's because they're technically inefficient and they get hurt when they pull that foot under center of mass incorrectly because they have improper technique and boom, goes the hamstring. Now, why am I so passionate about this? Because I went through that. I tore my hamstring so bad you could hear it audibly pop. Now, what did I not do? I didn't take warm-up seriously. I didn't take the drill serious. Um, I ran really hard when it was time to run really hard, and I competed like crazy. But I did not do the things that needed to be done for my technique. And those people who run against me in the past or ran against me in the past and sprinted against me remember me because, well, I was fast, but I also looked crazy because my mechanics were so jacked up. And lo and behold, I couldn't stay healthy. I was getting hurt all the time. Now, what my technique would look like is going to be very diff different than what Ashford's technique, who sprinted at SLU, would look like based on his build. Now, one of the things that everybody has to remember is depending on your hip structure, you know, you've got that ball joint that sits at the top of your leg. Depending on the way that ball hangs off of that bone and inserts into your hip is going to have a massive effect on how a person can move. So one of the things that is really valuable is you might want to get a movement screen done with these kids to figure out where their strengths and weaknesses are. Our uh, trainer at Parkway Central offers that up to our kids every summer. Now, could more kids take advantage of that? Could more of my kids take advantage of that? Without a doubt. But lo and behold, kids who technically or tend to be technically sound and move correctly tend to be the kids who don't get hurt and tend to be the kids who already have you know, really, really good technique, even under fatigue, okay? But every athlete is very different, so you have to handle them differently. Some athletes want to punch the ground. Some athletes are very bouncy. So right there, you've already got an issue. If you've got an athlete that looks like a bulldog football player and they're pushing down the track, that's a quad-centric sprinter. You're going to have to handle them very, very differently than you would handle a hamstring-centric sprinter. For example, with a hamstring-centric sprinter, they do a lot better at getting things uh, from plyometric training uh, versus, uh, you know, a, a quad-centric sprinter. And even though a quad-centric sprinter could benefit from some jump training, they actually benefit more from doing double-leg hurdle hops, uh, depth jumps, things like that off of, you know, bilateral. And then a, a hamstring-centric uh, sprinter does much better with, like, alternative bounds, single-leg bounding. They're very, very bouncy. You know, um, so these are things that you have to understand. Weight room has a has an issue there. How you train them as a sprinter, you know, you're going to have to spend a lot more time working on heel recovery with a quad centric sprinter than you would a hamstring centric sprinter. And here's the other thing you need to know. Even if they are a quad centric sprinter, it's better that we get them to become more and more hamstring centric. But to force them to stretch their stride out or to make them do things that they're not naturally able to do when you're running at full speed, that's not smart. So where do you train that? Where do you test that? 
in technical drills. That's where you train it. So eventually what happens is some of those skills get carried over into what they do when they run at full speed. Eventually they learn that and it's, it's actionable and it's something that their body will eventually adopt over time. Okay, so you got to know what type of sprinter you have in order to how you're going to train them on the track to improve their technique. If they're a really, really long sprinter, you know, and they're and they're and they've got very lean and wiry arms, the arms are probably not going to be a very big issue in terms of what they're doing. But the arms are probably going to be an issue because they're not being used at all. OK, or a long sprinter will have a tendency to overstride and try to lengthen everything out. And what ends up happening with them is they're not their frequency isn't as much. So in that, you're going to have to train zonal runs to shorten up, say, OK, between this cone and this cone, I want you to be as frequent as you can. I want you to be as quick, your turnover to be as quick as you can. Where a quad centric sprinter might be too short and they're very frequent and they're constantly trying to push the ground and they could really benefit from opening up. So when you train them, they would have a zonal run where, okay, you're going to build up, you're going to sprint it. And then this zone, we want you to try to get as long as you possibly can in your sprinting. Okay. To improve that. And again, it's going to require film and all of your athletes are going to need to be staying off of their heels when they sprint. But when you say that as a cue, you also need to know what you're talking about. So the athletes know what you're talking about. And guess what? All athletes, except for Usain Bolt, on a regular basis, strike their heel at some point when they sprint. So you're cueing them to do one thing. You're going to see something different, but it should sound different, too. It should sound a little bit lighter. And if they're running faster, then good. If they're not running faster, then you just continue to work on it through drills, and you don't force them or ask them to do that in a race. Now, all of this gets a benefit from reduced injuries, as we talked about before. And one of the things you have to remember is we're strengthening all of those joints and the tissues and the tendons and the ligaments and the muscles, and we're improving firing patterns. And by improving firing patterns, by improving specific strength, by improving mobility, the athlete is going to be hurt less. By becoming efficient, they will be faster. But if you don't have a lot of time, you can't handle that throughout an entire practice. So where do you integrate it? Like I said, it's integrated into your warm-up. It's part of what you do as a warm-up in your drills, in your action, to get the athlete's juices flowing to be primed for whatever you're going to do in practice. Don't ever do technical skills when the athlete is fatigued. They will not respond well, and they can get hurt. Don't ever expect that your sprinters can sprint at full speed or do technical drills correctly if you lifted the weight room before you went out on the track. If you do that before you go and sprint full speed, I'm gonna come and I'm gonna take one of these big books and I'm gonna throw it at you because that's not good for speed. They need to be as fresh as they possibly can be in order to sprint correctly. And I know some of you guys are like, well, what about the PAP effect and all that? No, okay? And if they're fatigued and you're gonna ask them to put their body into these positions that are a little bit of an overload in drills after being tired, then you're defeating the whole purpose because they're going to learn the drill incorrectly and they're probably going to get hurt because now they're stretching the movement system to do something that it's not really comfortable to do in the first place. You're already overloading it neurologically and it's going to cause problems. So you have to remember that this helps you. Now, the other advantage of doing this at the beginning of practice, doing the drills at the beginning of practice and the technical work is when a kid does look flat, they look like they're favoring one leg or another, they're not moving well, they seem stiff, they seem tired, that's your opportunity to use that as a diagnostic tool to pull them out of practice and talk to them about, hey, what happened in PE? Are you sick? Did you get sleep last night? You look a little stiff, you look a little rigid, what's going on? And it provides you an opportunity to catch the injury before it happens, and then guess what? Instead of having a torn hamstring, that takes you out of your entire career as an athlete like I had, you'll have an opportunity to get after it right away. Now, if you have PE or gym before, that's okay. That's okay. I've got a comment on here. But the thing you have to remember is that they're probably not lifting weights right before they go out onto the track. If they are, then you're going to need to have a really long warm-up. You're going to have to have a long time for them to recover and for those tissues to come back. 
And uh, if it's not PE every day, if you don't have it at the end of the day every day, then that's fine. But if it's a PE class, maybe, maybe you can get some of those drills done while they're in PE class, you know, while people are playing gator ball and tearing their ACLs and uh, playing, you know, uh, whatever they call dodgeball now that's not really dodgeball uh, or where they're jacking around in the gym playing pickup basketball. That's an opportunity for those athletes to do other things. And, you know, people can laugh and make fun all they want, but as long as they sit over there and say, hey, to the PE teacher, this is what I'd like to do in free time today in PE while these guys are doing this. Can I come over here and do my drills? Can I warm up? And if they've done that, that's great. And then they probably don't have to do that at the beginning of practice. However, I would tell you and I would warn you and I would caution you that it's much better to be under your eyes and paying attention to that. The other thing is when you're fixing someone's technique or you're changing what they're trying to do and you see something weird, don't automatically change it. If you start chasing a problem, it might have been a one-off. It's much better to spend some time, oh, maybe even your first week, watching the athlete move before you start really giving them strong suggestions on how they should change their movement, change the drill, do things differently, okay? And the reason why is maybe they're just, it's brand new and they're just learning and it's ah, you know, and then you try to change something right away when you first meet them and it screws up the natural improvement process that you're going to get, okay? The second thing you have to remember, too, is that sometimes it's just a one-off situation. So if you see it once, twice, three times, then, okay, this is probably something that this kid does on a regular basis, and eventually you're going to need to correct it. But it might not be something you correct right away because, again, you don't want to uh, create a what I call kind of an artificial correction that ends up leading to more problems later that takes away from that kid's natural ability to apply force properly. So spending some time watching them and getting to know their physical movements and how they move and their fluidity and flexibility or suppleness is really, really important before you start to make change. But then once you start to see some things that you know can be improved, we need to work on it. We need to work on it every day. And then you as the coach, that's important. One of the things that a lot of coaches mess up is they just let kids warm up and they don't watch what they're doing. And that's the time they sit there and they jaw jack with their friends. Oh, you won't believe what this kid did in class today or this parent. That's not the time. When you're coaching, you're paying attention. You're being very purposeful with everything that you're doing because you need to catch those things in order to improve those things. And they take a lot of time. And that's one of the ways that you can show your worth as a coach eventually is by improving that technique over time and making them more efficient and keeping them from getting injuries. Now, I'm going to knock on wood here in a minute, but I have not had but one hamstring pull in the last nine years. And one of the reasons why I believe we've not had a hamstring pull in my program is because of all these things I've mentioned over here about why we do drills and what we can do and how it's easy to implement drills and having packages and having a progression and having something simple for them to have in their mind's eye of be the hashtag, thinking about how you can maximize the, maximize the individual. And even if kids don't like it right away, the best way you can sell it is an in injury prevention. And this is something that I believe in and something we've done a lot of, and we've gotten really good because of it, okay? Not because of just drills by themselves, but we've been able to stay healthy and make it through entire seasons with distance runners and sprinters by figuring out what we can do to keep them healthy. And drills and technical work is one of the most important things. But circling all the way back, if you don't have a lot of time and you're a track coach, then you got to figure out things that you're going to pull out of practice, as I already talked about. Number one, most important thing you got to do is you got to run fast. But number two, you got to work on their technique. That's second. That's second in the clubhouse, second most important. So that's the second thing you protect amongst all other things because it'll make you faster, it'll make you more fluid, it will improve your power output, it'll keep you from getting hurt. Simple as that, guys. All right, thank you. Leave your comments below with anything you want. I'm going to rebroadcast this on YouTube, as I said before. Um, let me know anything you want me to talk about in the future. I just felt like I had to get this out of my soul 
because I was like, we got to talk about this because I got so much respect for Coach Porter and Coach Tripp. And I was just like, this is something I got to talk about. So if there's something that you feel really passionate about that you want to hear from me or from somebody else, I can bring guests in. I got a lot of friends in the track world, or at least I pretend to. <laughs> but, you know, there's people out there that would be willing to come on here. So if there's anything you want to hear from us, let me know. And again, all these drills and all these packages and all these workouts are in the Sprinters Compendium, which I have in the comments here attached below. So feel free to click on that. Check what people's reviews say about the book. Um, I promise you, it's not just me. It's 50 other coaches. In fact, one of Joe Porter, Coach Porter's ideas is in the book about injury recovery and all these things. So guys, the best coaches in the world, we steal from each other all the time to make ourselves better. Don't be afraid to do that. Don't be afraid to reach out and ask questions because that's the only way we get better. All right, guys, I love you. See you later. Have a great night.